by list of the assignments to see who was uh, on the schedule to lead the prayer tonight, and I can't find it. Does anybody have that? Anybody know who was supposed to lead the prayer? Since you, Dan? All right, Dan, if you don't mind, then uh, would you lead us in a prayer before we start our study tonight? Sure. There we go. All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the day that you've given to us today, for the rain, for the good news about a, a slow release of uh, getting back to a normal that uh, that we remember, Father. It's good that uh, that we have these opportunities, however, and you've used um, some hardships to cause us to grow, and I think that's great. And just hope that everyone sees these hardships as gifts from you, even though that, that many people are effective affected in such a negative way. Uh, help us to remain positive, to reach out to those who, who are impacted and encourage them. And thank you so much for Eddie and his uh, willingness to teach us uh, throughout the course of this, this, uh, this study. Uh, be with everyone, God, as we're, we're crawling up the walls, but at the same time, God, we're, we have much more time with our families and we thank you for that. And be with those that we've lost because of this disease and be with those who are apart from us and, and bring us back together soon and come soon in Jesus name. Amen. Appreciate that very much. Uh, let me begin with a, a word of apology. Someone uh, kindly brought to my attention that um, I actually got two stories wrong. Uh, last week we started talking about when the Pharisees had opposed Jesus using their traditional ideas and I mentioned about the uh, the disciples walking uh, through the field and, and grabbing grain and, and eating that on the Sabbath. Uh, that actually occurred back in chapter two uh, of the Gospel of Mark. And I was conflating that story with the one that we were talking about last week from, uh, from Mark chapter seven. Uh, the message is really the same. In both cases, the uh, Pharisees were criticizing Jesus because he and his disciples weren't living according to their traditional ideas of, of what Judaism was. And what Jesus rightfully pointed out is the fact that their traditions had really gotten away from uh, what the law itself was and what the meaning of the law is. And perhaps that's even more important, is understanding the, the true meaning of the law. Uh, anyway, let's begin in uh, Mark chapter 10 and verse 46. Um, and that's where I want to start um, this evening, Mark chapter 10 and verse 46. And what we find here is Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And, and most of the events that we're going to talk about in our lesson tonight uh, come from that last week that Jesus is in Jerusalem. What's interesting about this story is uh, this healing of a blind man is the fact that the man himself is named, not only he is named, but his father is named. Um, we don't really know why, uh, in this case, the person would be named. We've seen many cases of healing uh, through the Gospel of Mark where the, uh, the person who received the healing wasn't named, uh, but this man and his father are both named. Uh, some have suggested that perhaps he was uh, very well known or he or his father were very well known at this time period, and that's certainly a possibility. Uh, I think the more significant part of the story for me is the persistence of this man. That's one of the messages that we've seen throughout the Gospel of Mark, is how that when people recognize Jesus, they recognize his power, they recognize uh, who he is, what he has done, they are incredibly persistent in, in, in this case, in seeking that Jesus would heal him of his disease and his blindness, or in the case of others who had been healed, even when Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone, they go and tell everybody. Uh, to me, there's a lesson in that for us, that uh, the message of Jesus is one that should be so overpowering to us that we can't keep quiet. Uh, we're going to look in a moment about the entry of Jesus into, into Jerusalem. Now, Mark does not give us the account of where the the leaders came to Jesus and, and told him to stop the crowd from crying out Hosanna. But Jesus' response to them was along the same lesson, or along the same line. He said, if they were to be quiet, the stones would be crying out. The message of Jesus has to be like that within us. 
we have to be completely overwhelmed where we cannot be silenced. Uh, in, in sharing this message with others, but also praising our God uh, who has done this for us. Um, the crowd was yelling at this man to be quiet. And he just got all the much louder. I mean, you imagine this, the, you know, this is peer pressure at, at its greatest. And they're telling him, you be quiet, stop talking, you know, stop bothering Jesus. And, and he's crying out more and more. And then notice the term that he uses for Jesus here. He calls him Rabbanai. That we've got a song that we sometimes sing based on that. It is a, a form of the word rabbi, but it is much more personal. Uh, whereas rabbi just simply means teacher, Rabbanai means my teacher or my master. And, and so uh, his relationship with Jesus becomes very personal. And again, I think that's a great message for us is we need to not look at Jesus as simply a historical person, uh, even a historical son of God, but we need to look at Jesus uh, as our Savior. Sometimes we hear denominations, you know, kind of talk about uh, you need to accept Jesus as your personal Savior, and we know what they mean by that, so we avoid that kind of language. The language is not wrong. What they mean by the language might be wrong, but the language itself is not wrong. In fact, it's very biblical. That's essentially what this man is saying here. Jesus is my rabbi, my teacher, my master. Then we get into chapter 11, and we are now into that final week. Um, today, in many of the churches, they call this Palm Sunday, and almost certainly was the first day of the week. Jesus is going to come into the city of Jerusalem, as he has done a number of times before, but this time he's going to approach the city in a very different way. Uh, Julius Caesar was renowned for when he had uh, conquered the Gauls or when he had been successful in some of his campaigns as the leading general among the Romans, that as he would march back to the city of Rome, he would find the largest uh, white stallion that he could ride. And it was symbolic of his claim. He wanted to become the king, the emperor of Rome. Uh, at that time, of course, Rome was a republic, but he wanted the power for himself. And so to symbolize that claim, he rides this magnificent horse uh, to show him as the conquering hero. Jesus is marching into the city of Jerusalem to claim his kingdom. He is marching in as the king but a very different approach than what Julius Caesar took. Jesus is going to ride on a donkey. When you compare a donkey to a horse, there's a very large difference between them. Not only is he riding on a donkey, he's riding on the colt of a donkey, a one-year-old. This donkey almost certainly had, had nobody, certainly no adult ever to ride on it before. It would have barely been large enough for to, to physically even carry Jesus. I, I wonder if Jesus' feet actually scraped the ground or just barely above the dirt as he was riding on this donkey. He's riding into Jerusalem to claim his kingdom, but he's riding in as a humble king, not as one who is demanding his right, but in fact, Jesus is coming in as a servant. Uh, he is the servant king. And what, a, what an interesting contrast in, in views and ways of looking at our Lord um, as the servant king. Um, we find that when he is marching, notice what it says that the people were saying. This is a quotation from the book of Psalm. Hosanna is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the one, uh, is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest, another song that we often sing, Hosanna in the highest. I'll be honest, uh, I always had just assumed that the word Hosanna was very similar to hallelujah, that it was a word of praise. But in fact, it's not. Uh, the word Hosanna literally means uh, save us, or save us, Lord. It's really fascinating to look at this. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem as the king and the people are crying out to him, we are blessed because the son of David is coming 
save us, Lord. They understand their need. Now, was it because of the Roman oppression? Was it because their leaders weren't teaching them in the ways that Jesus was teaching them? Is it because they were just simply in general oppression? Uh, we don't know what was in the mind of all of these people, but the proclamation is a very appropriate. Jesus is their savior. And so they are crying out, Hosanna in the highest. This is their ultimate salvation. And again, we have to see ourselves in that. And I asked the question in the notes that I sent out to you, do we shout that from the rooftops? Do we shout it as loud as these people were crying out, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That, that This is our salvation. Jesus marching into the city of Jerusalem as the servant king, ultimately at the end of this week to die. That is our salvation. And every single one of us has to see ourselves along that road, putting our palm, palm leaves on the ground and crying out, Hosanna in the highest. We see that in verse um, 12 through 14, the next day Jesus is coming back. Uh, it's not as clear in Mark as it is in some of the other gospels, but what Jesus was doing each night, he would leave Jerusalem and he would go back to Bethany. Uh, we can understand the reason why, because they're, they were plotting to kill Jesus, trying to take him away in the dead of the night. We'll talk about that a little bit later in our lesson. Uh, but for safety's sake, Jesus is leaving Jerusalem every evening, going back to Bethany, and then coming back to Jerusalem in the morning. And so the next morning, when he comes back to Jerusalem, it says that he saw a fig tree. And he went over to the fig tree to get some figs. And when he got to the fig tree, he found that although it was in full leaf, there were no, there were no fruit on there. And Mark even makes the point to explain to us because it wasn't the season for figs. Now, when you stop and think about that, is it fair for Jesus, the creator, the one who made fig trees and determined their seasons for bearing fruit, to come to this fig tree and to curse the fig tree because it didn't have fruit when it was not in season? And, and some people would argue that this was, in fact, completely unfair. But one of the points that I made in the notes is to recognize uh, figs are not human beings. They don't have souls. And so Jesus cursing a fig tree is not condemning someone's soul. It's in fact just simply recognizing that it is an inanimate object. It's more important the lesson that Jesus was teaching here. Jesus was teaching that God has planted us. And he has planted us for a purpose. And that purpose is not to have nice, beautiful leaves. That purpose is to have fruit. God expects us to bear fruit in his kingdom. Now, fruit takes many different forms. Some people will say, well, if you haven't baptized somebody, then you're not bearing fruit. I, I don't think that that's a true statement. Fruit takes many different forms, but it still is fruit. It still is serving God in his kingdom, glorifying his holy name. Whether it be giving a cup of cold water in his name, whether it be teaching someone the gospel, or anything in between, it is still bearing fruit. And if we are simply making our leaves look good, then we're not very useful to God in his kingdom. And the result is the curse. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Paul tells Timothy that the Lord's servant must be ready in season and out of season. And he was talking particularly there about evangelists, but the idea is that we need to be ready to serve. And again, that's the thing we're going to see later in this lesson. We need to be ready to serve when it is convenient and easy, when it is not convenient, uh, when it is, in fact, uh, a difficulty in our lives. We need to be ready to serve our Lord in whatever way, uh, whatever is open for us to do. Then we come to where Jesus came back to the temple. Now, remember the night before he'd gone in, just kind of looked around and then left and went to Bethany. He comes back the next day with something in mind. 
And what he does is he goes into the temple and he begins to clear out all the money changers that were there. He clears out the, the ones that were selling the, the um, animals for sacrifice, that were uh, changing the money for the shekel sacrifice that people need to offer. Jesus has come there for the purpose of cleansing out the mess, if you would. And I mentioned that people have often regarded this as an act of rage. Um, I, I don't believe that's true. Uh, part of the reason is because of the fact that Jesus had already looked and saw what was going on the night before, and he did not do anything at that occasion. If it was an act of rage, he would have done something immediately. Instead, he comes back the next day, and he is overturning these tables. And he's telling them that you have turned my father's house, a house that is designed as a place of worship, that you turned it into a house of merchandise instead. And he calls them a robber's den. Now, some have assumed from that that when these people were changing the money, that they were uh, giving an unfair exchange rate or that they were uh, selling these animals at a highly inflated price. I don't think that's necessarily true. What they were doing, though, was making a profit off of it. How much profit really doesn't matter. What matters is the fact that it was profit off of worship of God. That's the key to understand here. These people are coming to the temple to worship God. They need the, the shekel, the half shekel, the temple tax. That's not a standard uh, currency in the Roman Empire, so most of them would not have had that. So they needed to exchange their money for the half shekel. And the people who are making this exchange are making a profit off of that. The ones who are buying the animals for sacrifice, if they came from a great distance, they couldn't have brought the animal there with them. So they have to buy the animal there. Again, the people who are selling this are making a profit. So they've taken a place of worship, a house of worship that's supposed to be dedicated for God, and they've turned it into themselves. They're seeking what will benefit them instead of seeking what would benefit God. And that's what Jesus is stopping. Notice it says that he was even preventing those who were carrying goods. Uh, scholars tell us that the courtyard actually was very large. The Herod's, th this is the courtyard that surrounded the buildings of Herod's uh, uh, temple complex there. And that many of the Jews who were traveling from one side of the city to another found that it was actually a shortcut to cut through the courtyard there uh, to be able to get to the other side of the city. And so they're carrying their merchandise. It, it became a highway. But again, this is a place of worship. And that's what Jesus was doing, was telling them this must be a place of worship, not a place of merchandise, not a thing for what you are doing but instead for what people are doing for God. As they leave the city that day, they pass by that fig tree. And Peter notices that the fig tree has withered from the roots of it. It's died. You know, the, by the end of the day, it's dead. And he says something to Jesus about it. Now, it doesn't seem to be so much in surprise uh, as much as just simply making a comment you know, look, Lord, the one that you cursed, it, it has died. What Jesus does, though, is teaches his apostles about the significance of prayer, the power of prayer, if you would. What he tells them is that if they have faith, they could say to a mountain, and this would have been the Mount of Olives right there in front of them, he would have been using it as an illustration. So you could say to this mountain, Cast yourself in the sea, and it would. People have questioned, well, you know, why didn't the Mount of Olives just get up and walk to the sea at that point? It, Jesus wasn't being literal. This was like parables. He's using the same sort of teaching to teach his disciples. But what he's telling them is that which seems to be impossible is possible through prayer. But I want you to notice there are two qualifications that are necessary for prayer to have any power. The two qualifications that we find there, Jesus says is first of all, faith. In verse 22, he says, have faith in God. And then in verse 23, he says, if you do this without doubt, 
then your prayer will be accomplished. But then he also says in verse 25, whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, Notice there, Jesus is saying, if you have any kind of grudge or any kind of unforgiving heart in anything against anyone, then your prayer is ineffective. Prayer has become powerless. Prayer becomes simple words with no meaning and no power. So it takes faith and it takes forgiveness. And I think we can understand with both of them, it's pretty logical to understand why. Faith means, first of all, primarily, we trust God. If we're asking God to do something, then we must believe two things about that. One, that he can, and two, that he's willing. And we need to understand God has all power and God has all love. So we must have that faith, that confidence, that God indeed is a God who has all power and has all love. That doesn't mean he's necessarily going to grant what we want, but it does mean without ever a doubt that God is going to grant what is best for us. Sometimes he knows better than we do. Often he knows better than we do, but he will grant what is best for us. That's what faith is. Then secondly, forgiveness is also logical. In fact, Jesus explains it here in verse 26. If you do not forgive, Neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. If we are unwilling to forgive others, how could we ever expect that God would be willing to forgive us? Then in verse 27, we find the next day when they return back to the temple, the Pharisees are ready for them. the chief priests, the, the, the scribes and the elders of the people. They're ready for Jesus. They've come with a delegation and they have a question. What is your authority? I think it's, it seems logical in this context. Their specific question was, what was your authority to drive the money changers and the, the sellers of doves out of the temple? The reason is because those people were there by the authority of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the one who granted them the right to set up their tables and to sell their goods uh, because the Sanhedrin also made a cut of the profit from that. And so it was a money-making business for them also. And so for them to come to Jesus, the question is fairly logical. What gives you the right to tell them they can't sell here? We told them they could. Jesus doesn't answer their question directly. Instead, Jesus asked them a question. And what Jesus does is he asks them the question, by what authority did John do what he did? By what authority did John baptize people? What authority did he have for teaching about the kingdom that was coming, telling people to repent? And the reason for Jesus responding with a question is not evasiveness. Some people have thought, well, Jesus just very adroitly uh, evaded their question. No, actually, Jesus is answering their question or trying to get them to answer their own question. Jesus is showing them the answer to the question of where John got his authority is the same answer to the question they're asking him. Where did he get his authority? The fact is, John got his authority from heaven. And Jesus got his authority from heaven. But as I pointed out, I think there's some other things that might be considered in there. The ones who are questioning Jesus must understand that they also can and should be questioned. And that's a great lesson for us, especially those of us who teach in any capacity. When we ask questions of our students, lawful, rightful questions, we need to recognize that we are also subject to questions ourselves. It's not an attack if someone questions us, why do you say that? Why do you believe this? In fact, it's the same question that we are asking our students to consider. That's a very important point when we are starting to study with someone, we're trying to, to share the gospel with them. We need to have the attitude. We need to show them that we have the attitude. We are just as willing to be questioned. We are just as willing to recognize that we can be wrong as we're asking them to be. When we talk about being open-minded, recognize being open-minded goes both ways. 
And there's nothing that will close a mind faster than when the person believes that the other side is closed already. And if you're trying to teach someone the gospel and you're approaching it the attitude, I've got all the answers and you've got all the, the questions, you're not going to get very far in teaching. But if instead we come with the attitude, let's study this together. You teach me and I will teach you. And you'll find that people will be more receptive to that kind of an attitude. And finally, I think what Jesus is showing here, and this is partly for the audience, is to prove that these leaders of the Jews were unwilling to acknowledge the power of God. They were unwilling to acknowledge it in John. We see that because Mark tells us what they were thinking, what they were reasoning among themselves. They said, if we say that it is from men, we fear the, the multitude because they believe that, that John was a prophet sent by God. And if we say that he is from God, then he's going to say, why didn't you believe him? And so finally, they come back to Jesus and said, we don't know. We can't say. What Jesus is showing is their unwillingness to accept the true power of God, to accept the truth from God. Sometimes when people are unwilling to answer a question, that says as much as if they had answered the question. And that certainly is true in this case. Let me pause at that point and ask if anybody's got any questions about chapter 11, um, what we've covered so far in our study. You know, everybody knows that they're calling John just a man and not. Go ahead, Nate. Uh, I couldn't quite hear the, what was being said in the background of the other. Sure. Thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Eddie. Um, I guess I hadn't really paid attention. It's not, uh, maybe it's a question, but so when he's coming in, I hadn't really recognized uh, there, I guess, in verse 11, <laughs> it says that Jesus came to the temple. Uh, I mean, it says, enter Jerusalem and into the temple. And looking around at everything, he left for Bethany since it was already late. Do you think, for chance, that <coughs> these merchants and money changers they could have already closed for the day since it was late? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, maybe that, they maybe they had a day off. I don't know. I'm just kind uh, of that's possible. That that is possible. Jesus had a longer journey than they would have because he was going back to Bethany, which is a, a, a travel of maybe an hour or two hours, whereas they most certainly would have been living in the city uh, close by. Okay. Um, and quite honestly, merchants generally will stay open as long as they can make a profit. <laughs> Anybody else with a, a thought or question? I was reading a commentary that said that uh, they expected around this time of Passover, there were about 2 million people uh, present. So when they say that they feared the multitudes, it's because there's uh, almost 2 million people or around, around about. Um, and in that same commentary, uh, it mentioned the fact that in John chapter 2, um, it mentions that the day before Christ enters the, the temple to drive out the money changers, he, he braids a small uh, whip and uses that to help drive out the the money lenders and the uh the animals and i always thought that was really interesting because it i because it shows this uh premeditation he, he goes in to to drive out the the sin that's in the house like as the master uh, he comes in not only to drive out sin but he is doing it under the ages of being the one who whose house this is for and driving out the sin that's corrupting it and while he later won't be able to, you know, truly cleanse it, although he absolutely could have, this is a, a step that he's trying to push them to show them what they're doing wrong and how they're doing it wrong. Uh, but yeah, I digress. Yeah, very good point, Mark, uh, Matt. And in fact, that even made me think about it. Um, in some ways, this is a symbol of what he's going to do at the end of the week. Uh, when he dies on the cross, he essentially is cleansing the house of Israel. And, and so this is a physical symbol of what will spiritually happen. So I uh, appreciate the thoughts there, Matt. Anybody else with any uh, thoughts or questions or comments? Eddie, can you hear me? Yes, I can. 
the first of the chapter is talking about Jesus is marching into town. Mm-hmm. It just sounds like an odd word to use under the circumstances. Yeah, I mean, marching isn't the exact word that's used there, but Jesus is coming into the city to claim his kingdom. Um, but yet he's doing it in a very humble way. And that's the, that's the great irony here in comparison to all the kings of the world who would march in to declare their, their kingship. Uh, Jesus here comes in with a very different spirit. Okay, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Dan. Um, uh, just looking at different uh, uh, kings that come in on donkeys, and, and this was a, a pretty common tradition as far as Jerusalem Jewish kings mm-hmm. goes. And it was a, a symbol of peace that, that I've looked at in, in different studies. And Jesus riding in on the most humblest, the most purest of mm-hmm. donkeys. I mean, think about that. The epitome of peace is absence of sin and death. And Jesus is the equivalent to that all day, every day, and twice on Mm -hmm. Sunday. And for him to do that had to have some kind of impact on the folks there of, hey, the king riding in on a donkey is peace. And this is the, the, uh, even a smaller, younger donkey than what we normally have. And we have Christ as well, signifying, I am king. And the definition of peace, mm-hmm. and he, you see how he is accepted as he enters in that manner. Appreciate those thoughts, Dan. In fact, uh, as you're mentioning that, it, it made me think as just a very quick aside, donkeys were common with the first two kings of Israel, Saul and David. What do we find Solomon? He went to Egypt to get horses. And, and from that point forward, uh, it's all about the horses now. It's all about the show. Whereas David, the precursor of Christ, is is like him in that way. All right, let's move on into chapter 12. Uh, Chapter 12, we're going to find a whole series of events here. Uh, Jesus now in the temple. And remember, this is going to be over a period of several days. Uh, Mark really doesn't give us a day-by-day account like some of the other writers do. But all of these events occurred in those three or four days that Jesus was coming to the temple um, and the various confrontations, the various uh, episodes that occurred there. What did strike me is the fact that they seem to come so rapid fire. Mark just seems to go one to the next, to the next, to the next. And in many cases, or perhaps every case, there is a connection from one event that gives us a thread that leads us into the, the next event. That's one of the points I asked you to to, to kind of look at. We see it here. They come and question Jesus. What's your authority for doing that? What's the next thing Jesus does? He teaches a parable about the, the Pharisees, about the leaders. He, he teaches a parable about a, a man who had a vineyard and he appointed vine growers to take care of the vineyard. And then at the time of harvest, he sent his servants to receive the uh, the produce of the vineyard, and of course, the vine growers uh, were told oppressed some, persecuted some, killed some. He sent more, and they did the same thing. And finally, the man was going to send his son. And the, the vine growers said, Ah, here's the son, here's the heir. We'll kill him and we'll take possession of it for ourselves. And of course, Jesus here is talking about the very leaders of the Jews that have been questioning him, that have Uh, opposed him at every step of the way. This parable is about them. They know it's about him. Uh, Because Mark tells us from that point on that they began to conspire uh, as to how they could uh, how they could destroy him, how they could kill him. Um, And in fact, they're going to fulfill the the parable. Because that's what they're going to do in just a few days from this. They're going to kill the son, trying to take the kingdom for themselves. And, And so this parable that angered them so much, they're going to fulfill it uh, to its completion. Uh, another group is sent by the council, and this group is sent to try to trap Jesus. And I think what happens is they're trying to use the same trap that Jesus had used against them. 
when they had come and questioned what authority, and Jesus had used this question to ask them, well, what about John? Do you accept he's from God or from men? They try to use a similar kind of trap. They are going to use the Romans and the Jews. They said, well, you know, teacher, we know that you teach the truth and everything, that you're not going to shy away from anything. So tell us, is it lawful for us to pay the poll tax? The poll tax was a tax that the Roman government had imposed upon the Jews when they would do the census that's mentioned at the beginning of the, the Gospel of Luke. And that's why um, uh, uh, Joseph and Mary had gone to Bethlehem. Uh, when there's this poll tax mentioned, it was a tax that the Romans were imposing upon the Jews to collect money for their, to pay for their legions that were imposing their authority, they're imposing their uh, uh, occupation of, of, of Palestine. And so the Jews hated this tax more than any other. And so they're asking Jesus in public, in front of all of these people, is it lawful for us to pay this poll tax? And of course, what they're thinking is, if he answers one way, we've got him. If he answers the other way, we've got him. If he says no, then we take him immediately to the Roman authorities and say he's teaching rebellion. If he says yes, then the people are all going to hate him because of the fact they hate that tax. But of course, Jesus is easily able to slip their trap because Jesus knew something they did not. Jesus knew that material things, money, is completely unimportant in God's kingdom. It has nothing to do with God's kingdom. God's kingdom is not material. John's gospel tells us that when Pilate asked Jesus, are you a king? And Jesus says, well, yes, I am, but my kingdom is not of this world. Uh, in, in essence, he was telling Pilate, I'm no threat to you or anyone else. My kingdom is a different nature. Even the Jews don't understand that. They think that it's a material kingdom. And so their trap is based on material things that Jesus says, you just don't understand the nature of the kingdom. He tells them to bring the coin. He says, you know, who made this coin? Well, Caesar did. Jesus says, okay, you give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Who made you? You give to God what belongs to God. God is much more concerned about you than your money. And that's what we have to understand about the nature of God's kingdom. Uh, then when we continue on, we find where the Sadducees, they think they've got Jesus trapped. The Sadducees did not believe in life after death. The Sadducees, interestingly enough, were not the liberals. Uh, we often use that word liberal as a, as a bad term. The Sadducees were actually the conservatives. The Pharisees were the liberals. The Sadducees believed in a very strict interpretation of the law of Moses specifically only the first five books of the law of Moses. They basically accepted the Torah as being the law of God, the Genesis through Deuteronomy. The rest of the Old Testament they considered to be the teachings that would go along with that. But they insisted basically on what you could read in those first five books of the law. The Pharisees, on the other hand, had done what Jesus has already identified. They had developed many traditional ideas, teachings that came from men that had in their minds taken on the authority of law itself. That's being liberal instead of being conservative. So the Sadducees come to Jesus with their very conservative mindset and they say, okay, you believe that there is life after death. Well, the law says, look at Deuteronomy. In fact, Kevin just covered this uh, this past Sunday evening uh, that if a, a man dies, um, and he had no children, that uh, his brother, or I should say, yeah, that his brother was to take his wife and, and father a child by her so that the family line could continue. And so the Sadducees have come up with this scenario where this happened seven times. Seven brothers, all of them die in order. The woman is married to all seven of them, doesn't ever have any children. And then they say, okay, in the resurrection, whose wife is she going to be? because she had been the wife of all seven of them. And now they've all been resurrected to life, which one is she going to be? The same problem. They do not understand the nature of God's kingdom. God's kingdom is not material. God's kingdom is spiritual. And so marriage, children, 
things that we think of as being so important in this world, and they are important in this world, because God made them important, have nothing to do with the world to come. And so Jesus says, you don't understand the afterlife. You don't understand the resurrection. He said that we will all be the angels. What do the angels do? We can see in various pictures, especially in the book of Revelation. They serve and worship and praise God. And what a glory it will be for us to be able to do the same. That's what Jesus is telling us about the afterlife. Then he asked them the question, well, as you read in the law, what does the law, how does the law describe God? He's described as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob dead or alive? Is he the God of the dead or the God of the living? As Jesus uses this phrase, as the Bible uses this phrase, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they are very much alive. Not alive in the flesh, but they're alive in the spirit because they are in harmony and fellowship with God. We need to understand that about ourselves also. That as long as we are in fellowship with God, we are among the living, no matter what happens to our physical bodies. And then finally, the last question, which I think is the only legitimate question that was asked. One scribe comes to Jesus and asks the question, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus answered from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, beginning in verse 4, which is what I call the great sermon of Moses. There are three basic sermons in the book of Deuteronomy. A short one at the beginning, the long one in the middle, and then a short one at the end, kind of a doxology, if you would. But this long one in the middle begins with the idea, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and being. Jesus tells them, Moses told the people of Israel, Jesus is telling us today, that is law one for every one of us. That we are to love God with everything that defines us. What we are is to be used in service to God. The man agreed with Jesus. He said, ultimately, that is the great commandment. And Jesus' response is, you're not far from the kingdom. I don't think he's saying it in the same way we look at Agrippa saying to Paul, um, you know, you almost persuade me or I'm not, you know, not far from being persuaded to become a Christian. I think Jesus is telling this man that he's ready, that when his kingdom comes, this man was going to be among them. Now, that's just my viewpoint on that, but I, I think he would have been one of the 3,000 that, that were baptized on that day of Pentecost just a, a seven weeks from now. Um, then we come to chapter 12 and verse 35, and we find kind of a shift here in uh, chapter 12 and verse 35, because now we find Jesus turning around and asking them questions. It says that Jesus began to say, as he taught in the temple, the, this is the idea of Mark showing now, whereas before they've been challenging Jesus and he's been parrying every one of their challenges, now he's going to start challenging them. And his first question is, how does David call him Lord? If he is, in fact, the son of David. And Jesus quote here from the psalm where the, David says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies uh, beneath your feet. How could David call his son Lord? Of course, they couldn't answer that question. But what that identifies is that Jesus is showing that he, as a son of David, and they couldn't argue that point. The genealogical records were there, proved both through his father and through his mother, that he was a son of David. So there's no way that that could be argued. But Jesus is showing that David can call me Lord. So there's the first step in what he's teaching. Then he talks about, in comparison to that, the scribes. In verse 38, Beware of the scribes who walk around in long robes and love the respectful greetings in the marketplaces, the chief seats in the synagogues, and the places of honor at banquets. In other words, they are self-serving. Everything about them is what is going to benefit me. 
that really connects us back to the cleansing of the temple. The cleansing of the people, the money changers there in simple and by extension, the, San, the Sanhedrin that gave them authority to be there, it was all about them. How could they profit from this? Jesus now is just simply identified or focused even more so. Just look at their own behavior. They want to be addressed by honorable terms. They wear robes that identify them, set them aside. They want the positions of honor. This is all about them. And in comparison to that, we've normally seen children. This time Jesus goes to the opposite extreme. Now we have a widow. Jesus is watching with his disciples, the people bringing the money and dumping it in the box of the treasury. This is the money that was going, uh, that was being used for the renovation of the temple, that was being used for the daily operation of the temple. Some people are dropping in large sums of money. This widow takes her turn and drops in two coins, equal the smallest amount of money that, that was imaginable even at that time. And yet Jesus points her out to his disciples and he says that she has done more than all the rest because she gave everything of herself. Do you see how this connects back to that question? What is the greatest commandment of the law? You love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and might. You love God with everything that is you. That's what this woman is doing. She is loving God with all that she has. And Jesus commends her for that. It's interesting to notice how that women are the ones who are being commended here in this last week. Again, we're going to see another one that comes uh, just a little bit further. Any questions or comments then down through um, the end of chapter 12 before we get into chapter 13? Go ahead, Nate. Um, I just think it's interesting there, just at the end of uh, verse 37, this is the large crowd enjoyed listening to him. Thinking of that, like in contrast of, seems to be a, a slightly different time frame, but thinking of the crowd that was with him um, when he fed the 5,000, like in John, mm -hmm. and he's speaking to them then, and a lot of them turn away because they're like, this is too hard to listen to. Um, but also, going back to sort of Walt's um, comment from earlier, this could be a whole new group of people that are listening to him, um, since that was such a crush of people for the Passover. At right. this time, maybe this is the first time they're hearing it. So it's just interesting to see, you know, <laughs> fickle humans, you know, <laughs> we have uh, different, uh, different attitudes for different times. Yeah, I think it's a very good point to make. We kind of look at these stories of Jesus and we just think the crowds were all the same crowds. They're, they're certainly not. Um, the ones you talk about in John chapter six, that actually occurred up around Galilee, around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, so although some of those people would have been here, uh, this crowd certainly is a different one overall than that. Any, any, good comment. Anybody else have anything they want to mention here? I appreciate the emphasis on, uh, you know, the the greatest command in verse uh, 29 and 30, and then how it's carried out in 44. I don't know if I'd ever made that connection before, but, um, you know, just the, just the fact that you've got those two groups of alls there and, and 30, love your, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And then verse 44, she put in everything she possessed, all she had to live on. It's just, I, I, I guess I, I don't know why I've never drawn that connection before as far as why that was put right there. That's one thing I like about the way that we're doing these studies by kind of looking for themes and patterns in larger groups. We're not doing a verse by verse study. And, and sometimes things pop out when you, when you look at groups of, uh, groups of verses together instead of focusing on particular words. Anybody else? All right, let's get into chapter 13. Then. 
chapter 13 is going to be the last evening, the last time that Jesus leaves Jerusalem of his own will. Uh, in chapter 13, he and his disciples are going out of Jerusalem again at the end of the day, um, and they're going up the Mount of Olives, and the disciples are pointing out to Jesus the, the beauty in what they see. Uh, it kind of helps us to understand the Mount of Olives was on the east side of Jerusalem. Um, it is higher than the city of Jerusalem. So as they're going up the Mount of Olives and they're looking back at the city, they, one of the other gospel accounts tells us they'd actually stopped for rest. Uh, so they would have sat there on the side of the mountain. They would have been looking at Herod's temple, which was covered in gold on top, and the sun would have been behind that. So they would have been having the sun setting in the distance behind the city of Jerusalem with this gold top temple in a beautiful, magnificent sight. It, it would, I'm sure it would have taken the breath away of any of us. And they said something to Jesus about how beautiful these buildings were. And that opened the door for something that they were not expecting. Jesus says, you see all those buildings? I tell you, the time is coming when there will not be one stone left on top of another. It will all be destroyed. They had to have been shocked by that, just shocked into silence almost, you know, to, to think about that. And finally, the Peter, I think, was the one who came to us and, and asked him, Lord, what did you mean by saying that? Tell us, tell us what you're talking about. And so Jesus began at that point to tell them about the events that would occur that would leave the city of Jerusalem, the city of David, the holy city in ruins. You know, it, it, it's such a destruction that had never been seen before. Even the Babylonian destruction would not compare with what would happen when the Romans got done with Jerusalem. Uh, and so that's what Jesus is warning them about what's going to happen. There's a number of things that Jesus talks about. I don't want to focus so much on the specifics of each of these things as, again, to look at it as an overall picture. He says, first of all, there's going to be signs, false signs. There would be people who claim to be the Christ that were not. There would be people who claim to be prophets that were not. There would be rumors of wars that turned out not to be true. There would be all sorts of you know, uh, portents that people would look at. Aha, this is it. No, th this is it. This is the sign. This is the beginning of the end. You know, I've lived on this earth now 60 years, and uh, I, I'm certainly not an expert in, in keeping up with everything that goes on in the world, but I've seen uh, time after time after time where religious leaders will tell us that these events are the signs of the end. Now, I can remember, I think it's 1979, when uh, the nation of Iran took the U.S. embassy hostage, and the people that were there in the embassy were held hostage. And I can remember many religious leaders of that time were identifying this is the sign of the end, the beginning of the end. Well, no, not so much. And of course, we can all point to various things that maybe we remember uh, of people who have pointed out and said, these are the signs of the end. That's kind of what Jesus is telling them. Don't get caught up in everybody saying, this is it, this is it, this is it. But instead he says, there will be some things that will come that will be true signs. And what he says is, first of all, in verse 10, the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. So before the end would come, the message of the gospel essentially had to leave the uh, spread out from the environment of Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 1, we find that it's really kind of the, one of the first key things where Jesus told his disciples, to go back in Jerusalem, it was told them what they would do, and they were proclaimed the message of the kingdom, being first in Jerusalem, and then throughout all Judea and Samaria, and then to the remotest parts of the world. So Jesus here is telling them the same thing. First of all, the kingdom has to be preached in all the world. Then he says, you're going to suffer. You're going to be arrested. You're going to be delivered up. He says, that when you are challenged for what you're going to say, he says, don't worry about it. The Holy Spirit will give you the words, will, will uh, allow you to speak in defense of your faith. We read several examples of that in the book of Acts. 
He says, then in verse uh, 13, you will be hated by all. I don't know about you, but when I read those words, they're kind of chilling. If, if I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus, a result of that is I'm going to be hated by all. You know, Adam mentioned how we find that word all used back in the previous chapter. Well, here it is again. And it's not really in a way that we like that. Nobody just says, you know, I, I'd love to be hated. <laughs> the, the more people that hate me, the better. Uh, but Jesus says, you will be hated. And then at the beginning of verse 14, we find what is very apocalyptic in its, in its uh, uh, the, the reading that we find here. These are phrases that are found particularly in the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel chapter 9 through 12 is a, a very lengthy vision that Daniel saw, or actually two visions that Daniel saw towards the end of his life. Um, and, and the language there is admittedly difficult. It had to do with things that, as at the very end of it, he's told these would happen many days in the future. Ultimately, I think it had to do with the very things that Jesus is talking about, the end of Israel, the end of God's relationship, God's judgment. Uh, upon his chosen people. We're told that when Daniel um, saw these visions at the end, he was exhausted and worn out. Uh, they were very difficult for him to see just in vision. Uh, this language is very hard. He, he talks about abomination of desolations. He talks about in verse 19, and those days will come as a tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of creation, uh, which God created until now and never shall. This was going to be more difficult than any people would ever, would ever face. It says that the Lord had to shorten those days just so that someone would survive, which he does for the sake of the elect. He says that in verse 24, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the powers in the heaven will be shaken, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he will gather together his elect from the four winds from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. Again, I want you to understand all of this language is taken directly or indirectly from the Old Testament. Primarily the books of uh, Daniel, Zechariah, Ezekiel, Isaiah. Uh, prophecies that had to do with the end, the end of Israel. And Jesus is quoting these prophecies to identify the answer to the question that Peter had asked him. Lord, what were you talking about when you said all these buildings are going to be destroyed? All of this in this chapter has to do with that. I, I firmly believe that. I know there are many teachers, many of the, the references that I use in my study talked about how that at some point there's a change from this verse between this verse and this verse where Jesus shifted from talking about the destruction of Jerusalem to final judgment. I don't see that. I see this as all one consistent message. The same thing happens in Matthew chapter 24. And again, I've seen people say, well, between this verse and this verse, Jesus shifts to a different subject. No, nope, it's, it's all the same subject. He's talking about how God is going to bring it into his covenant relationship with Israel. It was an everlasting covenant but the term that is translated everlasting literally means the end of the age. And Jesus is telling them, this is the end of this age. It's a covenant that ends because they didn't keep the covenant. God had promised through Moses that if they did not keep the covenant, there would be consequences, there would be curses, and ultimately they would be cut off. And that's what Jesus is telling them, the time has come for that or has almost come for that. And so he's telling him there will be signs of this. There will be many false signs, but there will also be true signs to let you know that this is coming. He tells on the parable in verse 24 that when you see the, the, uh, the, the tree putting forth its leaves, you know that summer is coming. He says, when you see these signs, you need to know that the end is coming. He says in verse 30 and 31, this is, I think very key to understanding this. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. How can heaven and earth end if we're just talking about the destruction of Jerusalem? And I 
hesitate to even use the word just. But if we're talking about that one judgment on that one people, heaven and earth didn't end at that point. But Jesus was simply talking about their world, their heaven, their earth. That's what I think is being described here. I think there's other places in the New Testament that use that same language, but I, we're running short on time, and I don't want to get into too much of that. Uh, finally, in verse 33, he tells them what that means for them. It tells them, you need to be ready. You have a responsibility. He says that you are watchmen, the doorkeepers, and that you are to be prepared and be ready for whenever the master should return. The master does not send a note ahead and say, I'll be there at five o'clock tomorrow night. The master just says, I'm coming back. I want you to be ready for when I come back. And that's what our responsibility is. We need to be ready. Now, how are we to be ready? Well, we've already seen it, bearing fruit. We are to be bearing fruit in God's kingdom. If we are busy bearing fruit in God's kingdom, can you think of a better time for the Lord to come? That's ultimately what Jesus is telling his disciples. You be busy doing the work that the Holy Spirit gives you to do, and you will be ready when I come back. Anybody got any questions or comments then uh, through chapter 13? I think we'll probably stop at this point. I have one. Um, yes, please. Verse 1 here where Christ is, is leaving the temple, this will be the last time that he has is, this will be the last time he enters the temple for you know for purposes, but it's also a metaphor for Christ, the deity leaving the church, leaving the synagogues, going to go fulfill what he has been foretelling them the whole time, after having admonishing them, setting them straight, driving out the sin that's there, but never the people never recognizing it and being unwilling to move forward to what he's been showing them. So he's, this is the, this is, uh, yeah, the metaphor of, of God leave. Well, no, it's not a metaphor. It's the, the actual God leaving the temple to go fulfill what's been set forth. There's a fascinating connection to Ezekiel chapter eight, which uh, Ezekiel sees a, a vision of the glory of God leaving the temple in Jerusalem. That's very similar to what you're talking about. Anybody else uh, with any comments, thoughts, or questions? Well, I appreciate again so many people that are with us. Um, looks like I see 27 that uh, we've got with us. Um, and Rita's want me to point out we've got one of our Bulgarian brethren joining us. We're so very happy to have him with us. We love you. <laughs> And it's great to get to see him. <laughs> and day, Sam Attic. <laughs> yes. Well, you guys say, Mr. Yeah. Pesha. Um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Hello, Bishop. Nice to Pleasure yeah. to have you. Glad I'm to glad be. you could join us. It's three o'clock in the morning for Biss right now. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> He's seven hours ahead of us. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, uh, different time zones, yes. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I'm I'm actually happy to be with you because of, I mean I haven't been able to see neither Eddie nor Rita in a long time. Far, far too long. <laughs> yeah, far too long. Last and time I, you were in Bulgaria, it was like on your way to Greece. It's still recording. I am so very thankful that God has given us. That, that we can share together as we're doing this evening. Mm -hmm. anybody, uh, anybody else with any comments or thoughts before we end? Hey, this is Alex. Uh, just real quickly, hey, Melita Hill had reached out um, and, and because of, she has a uh, landline, she's worried about long distance. And I told her that we could potentially um, put her on speakerphone if someone with a local number called her on Sunday morning. Um, and they, they could, you know, have their audio playing and she could listen in on her phone from, from that person's phone. Does that make sense? Yes. I, I do not have my, my um, actual phone number. I, I have a, like a VOIP that has a, an 859 number, but I was wondering if someone that has a local 
number would be willing to, to reach out to her on Sunday morning? Other people have this concern too about it being long distance. All right, well, uh, let's try and get that organized um, uh, as soon as possible. Uh, we may do that in an email or something and get, get that organized for both Pat and Melita to, um, uh, to arrange for them to be able to do this without having a long distance charge. Thank you. But everyone does not have a computer to get the email. Yeah, does, does everybody on the phone, can you just speak up right now if you don't have that? Um, if, you're, if you need a toll free number or are interested in this thing with, for Alex, can you just say right now? you probably won't get an email either, like Pat said. My phone is okay, but Lois Kemp, I don't know if she would enter in this study or not, but she is concerned about the long distance charge. It sounds like we've got two or three that we need to look into getting getting set up for. Yeah, this is Pat. Uh, on my landline, I don't have long distance. Okay. Okay. Is the 502 area code considered local enough or no? No. Okay. I have an 859 number. I'd be glad to. Even, eight five, one even eight five nine, some 859 numbers are long distance. Well, I'd be glad to take whoever 859 would not be a long distance number four. Um, if someone can get me Melita Hill's number, we'll start there. Yeah. We can do one oh, at least. We, we do. That I'm not so. Yeah, I can, I can either give you her number or uh, message it to you later or whatever. Yeah, if you'll message it to me, I'll take care of that and I'll make sure I call her on Sunday morning. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, sounds great. Uh, Adam, would you mind uh, closing with a word of prayer before we lose everybody? Sure. Uh, thank you. Let's bow together. Father, we come before you and we give you thanks for technology that we can meet together here, that we can be here in uh, cities and states and countries still connect with one another. We give you thanks for connection and the connection that we have in you. Uh, the fact that we come here with a like mind and a like purpose and we give thanks for your word that you've given us to study and to meditate upon and we pray that as we read through here and as we study and talk with one another that we would see your purpose for us and see new things in it every day. Uh, and come to realize that your wisdom is is the greatest wisdom that we can ever know. Uh, and, and use that appreciation to apply it to our lives um, and to help others in any way that we can so that we can bear fruit in your kingdom uh, and all things can be accomplished. Father, we pray that you would keep us safe, help us all to act wisely, help us all to act safely, but most of all, help us all to act holy. Uh, so that we can accomplish your purpose on this earth. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Eddie. And Goodbye, everybody. Love you love you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you. Nice to meet you, sir. Glad to have Brother Peshov with us. <laughs> yeah, you can call me good, sir. I'm not so formal. <laughs> John Boy. By the way, his, his name means Pearl, and that's what he is. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Brian, you want to say something?